All right, inviting Prime Minister to deliver their speech whenever they're ready. Yo, yo. Please set a timer for yourself. Sorry, ma'am, a little delay, ma'am. Just a second, ma'am. Can I start? In three, two, one. The arms trade is one of the world's most successful corporate enterprises. Not only has it created an economic system that grows regardless, it has normalized war and security responses to every social crisis. Good evening to one and all present here. My name is Aradhna Umesh, and I am here as supporting the proposition team. Um, the armed trade is the trade in weaponry and other military and, uh, and security equipment and services. Governments buy uh, arms uh, from their own national uh, industries or others. Sometimes one country give arms to another. The world is not a safe place. Nations are surrounded by enemies and threats from both within and outside the nation. To protect their citizens and borders, nations must arm themselves. Uh, in doing so, they must buy weapons from other country or manufacture them in their own country. And this is where arm trades come in. Arm trade is the only way for nations to obtain the weapon and defense system they need to protect their country. Moreover, it also helps countries in providing economic benefit to the country involved in the trade. They obtain foreign currency from the sale, which helps the development of the country, leading to improved security and sustainability in the country. The adoption of arms trade treaty marked a turning point in the international commu uh, community's effort to regulate the global trade of uh, conventional arms and to uh, promote peace and security. The arms trade treaty is an attempt to regulate the international trade of conventional weapons for the purpose of contributing to the international and regional peace. It also reduces human suffering and promotes cooperation, transparency, and responsible action by and among states, uh, contributing to the international and regional peace and security, and it reduces human suffering. It promotes cooperation, transparency, and responsible uh, action by states state parties in the international trade in conventional arms, thereby building confidence among um, state parties. Arm trade has also helped uh, Ukraine. The US in the la uh, largest provider of military assistance to Ukraine, having committed 27.4 billion since the start of uh, Biden administration, UK, uh, Ukraine might not be very developed, but as a result of these armed trades, it has advanced a lot in its military and technology. And only because of these armed trades, Ukraine was able to save itself from Russia's 100 missile launch and by using its technology to divert its missiles and uh, rescuing them by the usage of armed trades. If oh, armed POI. Sorry? POI. Yeah. Um, okay, so which is more important for you, short-term economic benefit or shaving millions of children and adults in Yemen? Sorry, I cannot able to hear you. Um, okay, so which is more important for you, short-term economic benefit or saving children and adults, millions of them in Yemen? I mean, it's not going to be short term because you are going to have that arm trade. Uh, I mean, the weapon you are getting from the other country with you. And as I told you, for Ukraine, they could have been in a big loss. But just because of these arm trades, they were able to save themselves from the Russia's 100 missile launch. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. So as I was saying, uh, if arm trades would not happen, then 
Ukraine would have lost everything. In recent times, the United Nations has taken a number of measures to regulate arms trade. This helps to ensure that no weapons are sold to nations uh, that are involved in civil wars and have a record of human rights violation. Thus, arms trade um, helps to strengthen global security by providing the arms from, fall, uh, from falling into the wrong hands. The, uh, in conclusion, arms trade is a necessary evil for the global security. It helps nation in protecting their borders and citizens from external threats. It also helps in the economic development of the nation involved in armed trades. Thus, I firmly believe that uh, armed trade is necessary for the global uh, uh, security. On this note, I would like to conclude my speech. Thank you. I thank the Prime Minister inviting hello, yo yo. Okay, I'll start in three, two, one. Good morning to one and all present here. I'm Riya Sharma, proudly representing Team Opposition as the LO for the motion, this house believes that arm trading is necessary for global security. But before I begin with my constructives, let me start with my rebuttal. So the first speaker made the point that arms trade has helped to improve global security. This is a narrative that the military industrial complex has used to sell more weapons. However, there is not really any evidence that arms trading leads to peace and security. In fact, there are examples of many countries like Switzerland, Netherlands, Canada, and others which have not only prospered, but also maintained their peace and harmony without being a large arms trader. My worthy opponent also mentioned about how the arms industry benefited the economy. However, research shows that the number of jobs that were actually created by the arms industry is relatively small compared to other large sectors of the economy like finance, retail, IT, tech, construction, etc. In the US in 2022, only 50,000 people were enabled in the arms industry. Now while, trading, now, while arm trading is extremely prevalent in today's world and is a hard industry to put down, it's important to also note, note that the motion is a THBT motion where the main phrase is necessary for global security. What this essentially translates to is that the trade of these weapons, which are eventually used to wage war and cause destruction in several parts of the globe, are necessary to ensure worldwide security and peace. Necessary in today's debate indicates that the existence of this trade is crucial to ensuring that the world flourishes. What our side does not have any problem with is the production of these weapons, as some amount of military power needs to be maintained to keep a country safe. But the moment a country chooses to begin trading weapons to other countries, we believe that it's extremely hard harmful for global relations and security as a whole. Therefore, our burden in today's debate is to prove to you that on balance, the cons that come out of arms trades outweighs the pros and that the benefit is exponentially more small when compared to the visible harms. To begin with, I want to provide you with an easy and relatable analogy. Now think about it like this. We all know that water is a resource that is essential for our survival and it's something that we cannot survive without. But if you get a cupcake, is it really necessary for your survival? No, it's simply not. This cupcake is not a need. It is in fact a mere want. It's not water. And this is exactly what our team will be establishing in today's debate. Through this analogy, we're trying to say that arms trading is not at all a necessity and a nation can still secure its defenses through other legitimate ways. For starters, if we manufacture arms indigenously, then we don't have to deal in arms trading at all. Our team is not saying that we should not have a proper defense system. We are just implying that the unnecessary extra amount of money that countries are investing in the arms trading industry is not good. We can instead focus on solving more crucial issues, including poverty, investing in education rather than arms trading. Moving on to my next point, which says that there can be a lot of cases of illegal arm trading as well, costing the overall economy of the nation. There is a notion running around society that having arm trading leads to so-called peace and security, which is in fact completely wrong. Weapons that are sold for legitimate self-defense purposes often end up in aggression, war crimes, human rights abuse, and even terrorism. Take the example of Saudi Arabia, which is among the biggest importers of sophisticated weapons. As per experts, many of these weapons actually ended up being used in the Yemeni civil war, which has in fact led to over 370,000 casualties and counting. To expand upon this, Team Proposition may also talk more about how arms trading is crucial to preserve a nation's defense system. And let me start by saying that we completely agree to this point. However, our team is not saying that we should not have a proper defense system. Again, we're just saying that we that the unnecessary extra amount of money that 
that the countries are investing can be invested into more important reasons. Defense companies spend hundreds of millions every year to lobby politicians and influence policy making. There is absolutely no evidence that arms trading has actually led to some peace and stability. All one needs to look at, look at are the recent wars in Ukraine, Yemen, Syria, and Africa. And it will then be clear that all armed trading has done is to perpetuate an endless cycle of violence and destruction. In fact, increased armed trading has led to more lethal weapons being used by all sides to inflict more damage and casualties. Now, do you really want the earth to be destroyed just for the benefit of few? Let me also take you back to the Cold War, where the US and the Soviet Union were locked in a 50 years long arm race. Hundreds of billions of dollars were poured into making a better, bigger and more lethal weapons and supplying them to their respective allied countries. The unsustainable spending at the cost of development eventually led to a breakup of the mighty Soviet Union and the end of communism as we know it. A recent example that also comes to mind is Pakistan, which has spent a disproportionate amount on defense, and the country is now on the brink of bankruptcy with tens of millions of impoverished citizens struggling every day. Weapons that are sold are led to 370,000 casualties and counting. Now, panel, the world team proposition lives in is a world where young Syrian children suffer due to terrorist groups with access to highly advanced weapons from around the globe. A world where authoritarian powerhouses like Iran flourish due to the excess weapons at their disposal to silence their citizens. And a world where nations who cannot afford to embark in the trade of weapons are subsequently put down by greater nations. So with this, our team's second speaker will be elaborating more upon how, by investing money on armed trades, it diverts the government's attention towards more important humanitarian crises, such as poverty. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. I thank the LO inviting DPM. Hear you. A very good morning to the House at large. Today, this House, from the affirmative side, strongly agrees with the given motion, which states that armed trading is necessary for global security. The international arms trade promotes a country's security as well as its economy by providing it with weapons and technology that help protect it from potential threats. The trading of arms, as defined by the first speaker, is the trade of weapons between a government and industry or a nation and another. Now, while the opposition might be naive enough to believe that this world is, a, is one of peace and harmony, and though they may believe that if you don't possess an arm, you won't be attacked by one. The truth is that in the world we live in, there's barely any peace, there's war, there's conflict. And just because you don't support the trade of arms, which helps us protect ourselves against other arms, mark you, the wars and conflicts we speak of won't stop, but you'll be in a more dangerous position than before without the international arms trade. Countries will be less secure and more vulnerable to attack from those who possess weapons more powerful than the few they do. Countries would be unable to defend themselves against hostile forces, and insecurity of these nations would further escalate the chances of conflict, creating an even more dangerous world than before. Just because one country doesn't engage in this trade or doesn't believe it's all that important, doesn't mean that the rest of the world will throw up their hands and lay down their weapons. This is our principal argument. Furthermore, here are some examples supporting it. Countries such as Tuvalu, Macau, Hong Kong, and the like, which lack well-developed arms and security and do not engage in the arms trade, have a higher crime rate than a nation that does, not, that does have these things. Furthermore, they are attacked more often than other nations at a ratio of two to five because they're considered vulnerable nations that have no army, barely any protection and no powerful arms whatsoever. Imagine one of these countries coming under attack by another country that possesses powerful arms. This would herald complete annihilation for everything the country stands for. According to the opposition, the arms trade makes weapons more accessible and thus more likely to be misused. Yes, I do agree that these arms are far more accessible than before and that there are a fair number of people who misuse them. I understand the point they're trying to make, but according to the UN, 5,000 people are killed or injured due to the trading of arms globally. But in a case where a country does not engage in this trade, it signals pandemonium for the latter, resulting in a bare minimum of 45,000 deaths globally. 
what would you risk my worthy opponent? 5,000 lives for 45,000? Countries such as Ukraine have gone through wars and have come out successful because of this trade. They imported weapons that were more potent than their own and were able to survive longer than they would have had they tried to battle with another country with weapons far more superior than their own. You must have heard of the 1975 Vietnam War. The US lost to the Asian country despite their attempts and the most powerful weapons they could make. But Vietnam succeeded because it had the sense to recognize that it lacked the arms required and imported them from several countries, primarily Russia, in the same way. Countries like Taiwan have managed to survive in the face of war due to their importing of arms from other countries. So let's take a stock of where we stand in this debate. We, on the affirmative side, strongly believe that in these perilous times, possessing powerful arms is crucial to a country's security. As though the country in question may not be able to produce superior weapons. Many countries developing or underdeveloped do not have an economy, a, an economy stable enough to produce its own weapons. Another point to note is that there are regulations on both trading and owning arms, which doesn't necessarily herald the end of the world or a rise in terror. And for these reasons, we stand strongly with our side of the motion. With this, I rest my case. Um, all right, I thank the DPM inviting the yellow. Yeah, just give me a second. Okay. okay, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Panel, at the point at which side proposition says that economic profit is so very important, but then they ignore those people on the battlefield dying because of the arms that got into the wrong hands via trade, they lose this debate. Three things done in my speech today, first on rebuttal, second on rebuilding, and third on our new constructive argument. First thing then on rebuttals, I think the entire case of side proposition so far has just been like one simple argument on like how countries are going to be less secure, how these countries can't manufacture weapons on their own, how like arms trade is the only way for protection, et cetera, et cetera. Then they suddenly come up and talk about economic profit, which is very shallow compared to like the lives being lost there. But at the same time, we're going to be telling you that like if there's so much like like countries are going to be spending so much more on military, which means like other sectors like social, educational and health will also dip. We don't really get a response on that. But then they talk about how like arm trade has helped Ukraine. I want to know why arm trade is specifically so necessary for global security. How without arm trade, the world's going to be a terrible place where there's going to be no global security. So far, we know that arm trade is sort of good, but we're going to be telling you how sure it might be like, good but at the same time it's not necessary for global security but at the same time we also think that arm trade is not that good we think it's actually worsening for global security but then let's let's like talk about very quickly how countries are going to be less secure when these arm trades happen you don't know where they're going to be ending up which means you don't know if they're going to be the weapons that kill your citizens on that battlefield the weapons that you supplied killing your citizens, backstabbing you, or whether they're going to help Russia defeat America. You don't know what's going to happen to those weapons. You don't know what's going to happen with those high quality weapons, which means that countries are not going to be very much like secure at the same time, because there's going to be so much more weapon manufacturing. There's going to be so much more violence. But then let's talk about how like these wars won't be happening. There's going to be a much less likelihood of wars happening in the first place when armed state doesn't happen, because when armed state doesn't happen, there's going to be less manufacturing arms overall there's going to be so much more peace and harmony and sure we don't think this is a world where like there's only peace and harmony but that's going to be relatively less than when like there's so much manufacturing so much trade and it's going to be misused in the hands of terrorists that is not something we were ever willing to be standing for but then on the two arguments we told you first on the principle of duty where we told you power in the wrong hands can lead to mass destruction how al-qaeda become like became a threat and bombed those twin towers because of the <laughs> mass amounts of weapons they own so when weapons are given to russia and china they're going to give it to military groups they're going to be funding terrorism they're going to be using it to hurt ukraine they're going to like beat america or like when like 
you know, small countries have to give them to China and Russia and like proxy wars, etc. So therefore, like the trade of arms doesn't help and it's the principle of duty for the government to protect their nation and ensure security. Uh, this does not happen when arms trade is happening. We do not want to do away with arms trade, but it's not necessary for global security. The only response we get, they say that, oh, you know, we get what you mean, but like according to the UN, arms trade is bad, but also like at least with the destruction of 45,000 lives. Like, okay, we wanted logical reasoning, not like, okay, the UN says this, so the UN is all always right but then let's just talk about generally like we've told you misuse and everything so that's probably going to be like so many more lives lost in the long like in the um longer run because like there's going to be so much misuse there's going to be so many more wars but then let's talk about second argument about arms trade incentivizing violence the reason one trades is for wars like to use against people by this you're incentivizing violence imposing threats on citizens that was our second argument but then let's move on to our third argument on why this is far worse for people in countries leading to bad global security two stands under this first on how weapons exchange and arm trade leads to so many deaths in the country itself for example when saudi arabia launched a military intervention in yemen in march 2015 at the request of the government so many citizens were deprived of their right to life it leads to conflict and the weapons supplied by external countries are those that shoot down those citizens but then second arms trade means that like these countries will be actively spending money on arm, on arms this means that these countries will not be spending that much money on things like social development educational development etc this means that individuals aren't getting the best quality of life in these nations which means that the health sector is suffering that they aren't able to provide the best treatment for the citizens or for their military that die fighting those wars. So then why does this lead to bad global security? Because there is going to be bad health, not enough resources, poverty in these nations leading to overall like bad global security. This means that arms trade is not necessary for global security at all. Instead of telling you like how controlling these arms, conserving these resources, maintaining good health and social sectors contributes largely to global security. So when I, as Saudi Arabia, realize that the US is trading me weapons and is actively showing support towards my cause, I'm more likely to be ruthless in my efforts to bring down my enemy. What this means is that I'm more likely to, be, to send more weapons into the region and spread more of the military throughout that region attempting to crack down on the locals to gain power to gain power because I know that I have a shield of huge global superpower in front of me to ensure claims of war crimes stay away from me as a nation. I can suddenly become a lot more vicious translating to the deaths of Yemeni children and adults due to the frequent bombings of the country and causing my enemy Iran to retaliate even more harshly against my military presence there leading to both the deaths of citizens and the indigenous population of the country I'm attacking. This is something the side opposition was never willing to stand for. Thank you. All right. Um, I thank DLO inviting government whip here. Yeah. A very good evening to the house at large. Today, this house from the affirmative side strongly agrees with the given motion, which states that arms trading is necessary for global security. So, on to the rebuttals. The first speaker said that global security doesn't lead to peace. But my worthy opponent, global security is a synonym of peace. And yes, would you rather be attacked but not protected? This is what you stand for. The arms industry is small and doesn't contribute to the economy. These were your words. USA's weapon industry amounts to $50 billion. Does this contribute to a small part of its economy? No, it's nearly half of its economy. Are lives important? That's the question you raised. Yes, lives are important. And this, this trade helps us protect lives. You said that the, the countries should produce indigenous weapons, but half of the countries around the globe don't have an economy stable enough to, to produce their own weapons. Indigenous production costs more than trade. These uh, while you stated that indigenous production costs less than trade, producing a weapon costs 50% more than trading it or importing it from another country, wherein you can get a better, more efficient weapon to protect your country, your citizens with. Protection in arms cannot be, yes? Um, what guarantee do you give our side that these, uh, that the money received through arms trade is going to be used to better the citizens as opposed to getting more arms. Okay, first of all, I do not accept the POI, but can you please ask that again? 
yeah so uh, again what what actually so what um okay what actual guarantee do you give on your side of the house that the money got through um through these trades is going to necessarily be used to better the citizens as opposed to get more arms okay yes so according to the un 50% is spent on the education of a country uh 25% is spent on the education of a country 50% is spent on the health of a country whereas the rest of it is spent on a military this is usa's economy whereas in india 50% is spent on health 45% spent on the military and the rest spent on education so over here you can see that more of the percentage is spent to benefit the citizens in opposition and now when you spend it on the military you also spend it to uh, for the betterment of the citizens to protect them so i hope this answered your question so i'll continue okay, you don't with have to wait for an yeah affirmation so protection and arms cannot be compared to a cupcake they are a necessity for our country a country cannot survive without arms in a world that so in a world that in, wherein every country possesses some military weapon some arms which without which a country cannot survive they'll be placed under attack as as mentioned by the second speaker a uh, poi yes so basically you're saying like uh, these countries by arm trading it will like benefit them economically uh, and uh, but however our point is that how can that be seen as a bigger picture since so obviously the bigger picture is the destru mass destruction by trading these arms forces and the benefit is only for a few like like the traders like uh, so exactly how do you compensate for that since we're looking at the bigger picture over here the destruction of our earth and maybe even a next world war okay so this does not necessarily herald the end of the world because if there's a country which is not armed and the rest of them are armed they'll just attack on that country looking at it as a vulnerable country that destroys all the country stands for secondly these arms are traded in order to raise a country's economic uh, a country's economy and for the other country for its protection so i hope that answers your question as to why arms are necessary for a country and why this trade is necessary for a country so the cold war you mentioned between usa and the soviet union doesn't involve the trade of arms in any way they developed their own arms they spent it out of their own economy but they did not trade it or did not import it from other countries which renders your debate uh, this point completely uh, just a minute please which renders this point completely useless for this debate so coming to the second speaker you spoke of economic profit you spoke of how our debate was not up to the mark you spoke of our flaws you tried to rebut us but instead of pointing out our flaws you should have listened to our debate as all of your rebuttals were answered in our previous debates this debate is not about whether or not it's we are supposed to ban this trade as you said but this debate is about whether or not it's necessary you also spoke about how our debate was not logical enough whereas we presented the statistics and facts which proved our debate 5000 people are killed due to arms trade which is coming down at a rate of 10% per yeah and 45000 people are saved is this not logical enough for you you did not prove to us why it isn't necessary but you spent your time rebutting us without giving us any concrete reason for believing you you will say china uae and other countries spend 50% of their economic wealth in the health sector 25% of it in the the education sector and the remaining in the military which answers your question and your rebuttal as to why as to the wastage of money which comes into the economy and does not benefit the citizens in any way with this i rest my case
All right, I thank uh, the government whip, inviting opposition whip here. here. Um, okay, uh, can I have 10 seconds to formulate clashes? Sure, yes. Okay, yeah, so my time starts in three, two, one. Panel, according to the UN, at the point at which side proposition thinks that helping their economy is paradise, we tell you that that money used to the economy is the reason those millions of people that could not get uh, could not get adequate health support and those millions of kids could not get education. Three main clashes throughout today's debate. Number one, our principal clash on their moral obligation and our principal duty. Number two, which side benefits citizens on the ground? And number three, which side benefits global security? On to clash number one then. While we tell you how countries have the obligation to help their citizens, their side talks about how countries like the United States have the obligation to help Ukraine. While our side does agree that this is a good use of arm trade, let us look at what will happen in the future. As explained throughout our side of the house, to win today's debate, our side needs to show to you that our uh, that our uh, the harms we give you throughout this debate outweigh the pros they attempt to show you. Now let's see what will happen in the future. When the war is eventually over, weapons are going to be left in Ukraine. And as explained by both my first speaker and my second speaker, these weapons are eventually going to be used by unorganized and harmful militias to attempt to begin getting power and to attempt to start harming other countries and uh, the countries like Ukraine and Russia. Because when I, uh, to give you an example, when I as a US am sending weapons into Saudi Arabia to aid my allies' strength in the Middle East and to ensure I have a presence there, I do not know whether my weapons are going into Syria or going into Yemen. And I do not know whether ISIS one day after Saudi Arabian troops have been massacred in Syria, and my weapons land up there. I do not know whether ISIS will pick them up and start using them against my forces in Syria. That I do not know. And additionally, I do not know whether, whether the weapons I sent to Saudi Arabia will end up in Yemen and will be left for Iranian use where Iran is my enemy and where Iran can directly use it to harm Saudi Arabia and me. To give you an impact, Instances like 9-11 and the Paris attacks are direct, uh, are, direct, uh, are direct repercussions caused by the fact that the United States some few years ago decided to send weapons and military aid to Mujahideen groups in Afghanistan to combat, uh, to combat Soviet expansion there. And because of that, now terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda exist, which use these weapons to destroy and harm countries like Syria and Yemen, and currently are doing so much of harm in the world, killing, uh, killing hundreds of people in Syria, killing hundreds of people in Afghanistan. Now on to clash, and US law, uh, UN laws are there, but why do these laws not matter? Number one, the UN, uh, even if the US, uh, UN exists, does that mean Saudi Arabia is not killing the hundreds of kids it kills in Yemen? Does that mean Iran is also not killing the hundreds of kids in Yemen? Just because the UN exists doesn't mean war crimes and other situations of bad usage of these weapons do not exist. Something we have proved to you throughout the debate. Clash number two. Economic profit is more important than the harms caused to the people is what side proposition is trying to tell you. But here's what we are telling you. Number one, this economic profit is going to be used to get more arms, to increase economic profit, to get more arms, to ensure that the country is stable. For example, if I am Russia, I would want to get as many weapons as possible to try and dethrone the United States. Essentially, what this means is that I will send weapons to countries like Iran and uh, Iran because they are countries that need these weapons and they are more likely going to start causing more war and they want these weapons. I, as a bad actor, as characterized by my second speaker, am looking for a stable market where my weapons can continue to be there 
for tens of years, tens, uh, tens of, uh, tens of uh, uh, decades, where my weapons can stay there, and I can have a stable income for my country, where I can use these weapons to dethrone my enemies, like the United States. What this means is that, first off, I am directly harming the United States through proxy wars with Saudi Arabia, and number two, I am. I am causing significant damage to countries like Saudi Arabia and US allies. What this means is that I am killing hundreds of Yemeni people. And what this essentially means is that I'm breaking so many laws and I am causing the deaths of people. But eventually at the end of the day, the blood is not on my hands because then again, the weapons are being used by Iran. And because of that, I, the, Iran is being blamed, not me, showing that I am benefiting while Iran is going down the day. For these reasons, Judge, I, I beg you to vote for Sidecon because throughout this debate, we have shown to you how arms trade is much more harmful than the benefits side proposition gives us. Yo, I... And for those reasons, I rest my case protected time. All right. I thank the opposition whip. I thank you all for this very really exciting round. Uh, I'm going to come back with my OA in about two, three minutes. Meanwhile, Follow the same drill as always. Please just put your wallet in the chat. This is for the spectators, not for the teams, of course. Yeah, I'll be back in like three, maximum five minutes. Stay put. All right, I think I will begin with my OA now. Uh, comments. I mean, sure, there were problems in this debate. I think this debate was very murky for me to judge for a couple of reasons, which I'm going to come to. But then in terms of the word, it, for me, the motion falls and the opposition side takes this debate, but it is on a very, very close margin of victory. So it's not like a substantial win. I'll tell you why that happens, right? On to the general comments then. I think this debate is abysmally lacking when it comes to characterization. So when you go ahead and talk about global security, the stance from both the sides, you cannot talk about global security without actually explaining to me what it means, right? Or what that looks like, or what the manifestation of global security is at the end of the day. I mean, when will you call the world a globally secure place? Until unless I have that characterization, I'm unwilling to credit any of your arguments insofar as I do not know what you think or how you perceive, uh, think of or, uh, about global security or what how you perceive it, right, in terms of its manifestation and materialization. I think that's a, a vacuum that has been created or perhaps not filled in the first place by any of the sides because of which I find it extremely hard to credit any of your points from either side, right? 
but then on the idea of characterizing smaller countries as opposed to the bigger countries and the bigger countries potential to create arms and trade in arms and power dynamics and what they're going to look like was again important more on the government side because you're consistently pushing this idea of how smaller countries would be left behind in the race if there is no arms trade right and given that there is a combative world that we live in we need to ensure that there is level playing field for all countries if you want to push that kind of a narrative i first need to know what is it that the developing countries don't have that perhaps the developed countries have more right or one country does not have or perhaps and that is why they look out like look up to the other country for 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 the thing to be conferred or furnished on them right i do not get that power dynamic i do not get the imbalance that you're perhaps alluding to but never explicitly mentioning which is why i'm unable to understand what you're saying when you talk about a level playing field whatever i'm able to make of it is all implicit understanding and opposition suitably rebuts it when they go ahead and say that oh even if you acquire money this acquisition of money does not by default assure that it's going to be used to words well meaning and it could be used in um, 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 in a factor of places where perhaps it wouldn't be conducive for you to invest in so it's not necessarily always leading to a very conducive and palatable society for the populace right this is to say that if you want to take this argument on gov you need to give me a substantial rebuttal to what the opposition was saying in terms of how there is no assurity of uh, meaningful usage of this money or you had to come up with like a different sort of a characterization of power dynamics where you explain how perhaps the idea of fear works right or how the logic of deterrence works right so logic of deterrence i hope you guys know is basically when you possess as many uh, like weapons or like as good a paraphernalia as i do in defense which is why i uh, desist the urge to wage war or uh, uh, yeah we are lock horns with you because i know you are equally capable of causing damage right so there is fear of devastation from the other side which is why i in myself also am unwilling to like initiate something right which means that the power dynamics are balanced when you have equal uh, capacity for waging a war and causing equal kind of like mutually the same kind of damage now that's logic of deterrence you could probably run on uh, your argument on those lines and why power dynamics become important so some such thing right until unless that's i mean for as long as that was missing and there was no substantial uh analysis of why smaller countries will be benefited or how that's assured or how it's always going to be the case i am bound to give this argument to the opposition right i think and this is the biggest claim because government is consistently talking about this so this isn't the biggest clash because it's very important to the motion it's biggest is that it, it is the biggest clash because the government continuously talks about it right so if you have a primary argument you want to back it up as much as you can right uh, because if you lose out on that then you do not have like and answer the argument even to fall back on so i think that there was like a big burden on government which uh, they weren't perhaps able to fulfill because of which opposition was able to capitalize on the loopholes and thereby take the clash right on the idea of uh, a comparative then why do i then say that the side which wins also wins on a small margin of victory for me because i think there is an obvious uh, absence of comparative understanding i mean i understand your whip speeches are good okay and whip speeches uh on both the sides are agreeable but the problem is that the comparative has to be there even in speeches which aren't whip uh, or third speaker speeches right because the thing is that only when you compare uh, a certain thing to the other like your proposition to the other person side's proposition would i be able to make sense of what you're saying for example i think a first speaker spends a lot of their time on opposition telling me that indigenous production is still fine that we're not against production that we do not mind production etc etc my again problem coming back to the characterization is this you don't any of the sides doesn't bother to like define what status quo is like right are we globally volatile as a, as 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 a global society are the countries often locking horns with each other or is everybody striving towards democracy what is happening is something is is something that i do not have clarity on because nobody cares to characterize that to me but even in the absence of that characterization again opposition says that it's okay for you to indigenously produce like uh masses of we- weapons of mass destruction if you please or like any sort of weapon right the problem that i have with that then is why do not you preempt the argument of what the government is saying to this right the government is saying that the smaller countries will be at a loss because they don't have enough money to expend on defense when they have other things to cater to right like the pillars of uh, human well being like healthcare education etc so the bigger countries are definitely going to have more equipage defensive equipage because of which the smaller countries are always going to be in constant like 
uh, constantly perturbed by the prospects of being attacked. So the power dynamics are skewed as far as defense is concerned. Why do you not then preempt that actively is something that's still a question mark for me. Although I understand on opposition, the deputy and the and the VIP speeches are really nice in terms of how they're able to substantiate that uh, there are obvious harms of creating, right? Although they do concede that there might be some potential benefits, they're able to prove to me at the end of the day that there are more harms than, benefit, than uh, benefits, right? And I think that most of their benefits stand simply because the government side chooses not to engage with opposition, right? It's not like, you did rebut and then those rebuttals fell, fell short, right? It's just that you did not initiate rebuttals on a lot of the points, such as terrorism, right? How can you deal with this entire idea which opposition is pushing on their side of excess production because of which it uh, uh, reaching uh, like anti-social elements in the society and thereby creating uh, anarchy, right? How do you deal with the, that situation? Any rebuttal would perhaps have worked or like some sort of like an analysis so that I could weigh this argument. I simply couldn't and they've been unopposed, which is not the best thing as such, right? So for now, I think that's pretty much it. I know this wasn't like a proper OA, but I just need to make certain things three years rather than like justifying one side's been over the other. I hope that's fine. Ask me questions if you have any that's more important. Ma'am, for the web speech, I have never uh, done the third one. And I just did it like an impromptu and my throat gets very dry. But Nandini was supposed to go third and her competition ended at around uh, five o'clock. So I thought that she would. work. So I didn't prepare a speech for the third one. So that's why I was not able to do it that well. That's perfectly all right. This is a mock debate. It's all for practice. Nobody's judging nobody here. So it's good that you practice with speech for an emergency situation. I appreciate that. Also take care. Um, others, questions? Are there no questions from government and opposition? Ma'am, I have one question. Uh, whenever okay. I uh, do a debate and I do it for more than five minutes, then my throat gets very dry and then I'm not able to speak. So how should I stop that from happening? Um, just keep yourself hydrated. Have water nearby. If you want a water break for like 10 seconds, don't fret. Uh, take your time. Tell the adjudicators to stop the timer. They will. Okay. It's okay. And don't be nervous if that's what makes you feel like uh, you're tired in the middle of the speech. Do not feel nervous. Don't write your entire speech down. That also like curtails your ability to adapt in the moment. So adapt to the debate, right? Because it's ever changing. It's not like it's a static thing. It's dynamic. Somebody says something, you have to rebut it. It cannot always be premeditated. So try to get into the in, in into that habit of just like speaking impromptu if you have to. And like not not being fretful. You lose one round, you win another. Even if you lose the entire tournament, there's something learned. It just comes to you. So don't be too serious and don't take this too seriously. I mean, yeah, to some extent, don't do that. Okay. All right. Uh, are there no other questions? Um, okay, I will take that as a no. So, so uh, we can call it a day, I guess, for today. Uh, I'll meet you tomorrow for the last mock. Um, yeah, for the last mock tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining in. Bye. If you have questions, stay back. If you don't, leave. Thank you, ma'am.